So good afternoon. Um, welcome again and bienvenidos to the North Coast Conference on Precision Medicine. I'm Dana Crawford, Professor of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences and Associate Director of the Cleveland Institute for Computational Biology here at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so if you did not join us yesterday, I just want to mention that this is an annual event that we have here in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, organized by the Cleveland Institute for Computational Biology. Um, Obviously, we would usually have this in person, but this, this year is a virtual event held over two afternoons, and this is day two of the symposium. Um, our symposiums in general cover topics in genetics, precision medicine, and all things diversity. So day two this afternoon will feature four invited speakers. Uh, they will each give their talks, and at the end of the talk, there will be some time for questions. If you would like to ask a question, I invite you to please type your question in the chat box, which I'll be monitoring. You could also try to use the official hand function, uh, raising hand function feature in Zoom, and I will also try to monitor that as well. Um, this session is being recorded with permission from the speakers today, and I do ask that uh, you remain muted during the talk um, unless you want to ask a question after the talks. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce briefly our first invited speaker, Dr. Ruang Li. He is currently a research associate um, in the Penn Institute for Biomedical Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn over the screen to Ruang. All right, thank you, Dana. Let me share my slide. Okay, can you see? Can you see my slide? Okay, I'll, I'll start. Uh, my name is Ruang Li, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to present today. So the title of my presentation is Potent Risk Vectors Improve Predictions for Complex Diseases. Uh, the outline of my presentation is as following. So since we had many speakers yesterday to talk about polygenic risk scores. So I'm just going to give a brief recap of the polygenic risk score or PRS. Then I'm going to introduce polygenic risk vectors or PRV. Then after that, I'm going to present how we use the electronic health record data to develop and apply PRV and PRS. Then I'm going to show some applications of PRV in the eMERGE and Penn Medicine Biobank data. Then in the end is the summary of the presentation. So first, a brief recap of the PRS. So I got this figure from this paper. So to generate a PRS, you start with a association statistics from the GWAS. So in the GWAS, you will get the beta values for each SNP across the genome. Then you can use a subset of SNPs. So depending on how you select the SNP to calculate a PRS. So in this paper, they call it a GPS, but it's the same as the PRS. So depending on what SNPs you put into the PRS, you could have a different uh, number, a different performance of the PRS. So in this figure, they show there are many possible PRS for each phenotype there, and they can be separated by the different performance accuracy. Then you can select the best perform performing PRS to try to see whether you can separate the patients with cases or controls. So you can kind of classify the patients with high risk, intermediate risk, or the low risk. Then finally, you can combine the PRS with some other uh, variables such as age, gender, and environmental factors to give you a composite kind of risk score to give you a better prediction of the disease risk. So this is kind of the overview of how you perform a PRS analysis. And so I really want to focus on how you calculate the PRS. So in PRS, you use the beta values from the external GWAS summary statistics and multiply by the dosage of the SNP. So this is typically your internal genetic data. Then you add up uh, M SNPs, so M depending on how you select the SNPs. So, and this is very straightforward. So one issue with this approach is most of the beta values from the external GWAS are generated under the additive genetic model. 
As a result, your internal GWAS has also decoded as the additive effects. Uh, so what I mean by the additive effects, so in the genetic, when you perform a genetic association, you have to choose a genetic model you want to model it. So, and the most common genetic model is the additive effect. So in the additive effect, you assume there's a linear relationship between the number of minor alleles and your phenotype. So for example, this could be, uh, this is just one SNP. Uh, so with the increasing of minor allele and the, on the y-axis is the phenotype, you can think of this as height. You see an increasing trend of height. So the additive effect assumes this linear relationship between the SNP alleles and the phenotype. But there could be also other type of genetic models. So for example, the dominant model, the recessive model, the overdominant model. There could be also other type of genetic models. They are all valid uh, when you perform a genetic associations. But the most commonly used uh, model is the additive model when you perform a GWAS. Uh, so this paper performs some simulation studies to look at the power of the additive model. So this is just one of the papers. There are many papers that show a similar result. So what they showed is uh, when the true effect is additive, then the additive model has the highest power. And the dominant model has a slightly lower but still high power. But the recessive model don't have a very high power to detect additive effect. So similarly, under the dominant model, the dominant, uh, under the dominant effect, the dominant model is the best, followed by the additive, the recessive have really low power. And the recessive, you have a similar story. So what the conclusion from this simulation is, when you have a true additive and dominant effects, the additive model has relatively high power. But when the true model is not additive, for example, when it's recessive, the additive model has really low power. And in addition, I think it's very important to distinguish power and the accuracy. So the power is talking about the significance of the association, which are what the simulations are showing. But what the goal of the PRS is accuracy. So the accuracy and power do not have a uh, direct one-to-one uh, -one, uh, 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 it's not equally one-to-one. -one. So it's maybe worth exploring other genetic models. We, we talk about uh, using PRS to do pr predictions. So that's why we thought about a simple kind of improvement to PRS is the P polygen risk factors. So in polygen risk factors, uh, we would similarly pro uh, perform a PRS analysis. So PRS additive is the common PRS. Then we will also generate a PRS dominant effect and PRS recessive effect. The polygen risk factor simply adds up the different PRS together to give you a final PRS. And what we think is the PRV should be better, could be better performing the PRS because it contains more information uh, other than the additive effect. So that's our hypothesis is the accuracy of the PRV is higher than the accuracy of the PRS. And to show, uh, to show this, we turn to electronic health record data. So generally, the PRS are developed and applied, in the, applied to the GWAS data. But more and more EHR data have linked biobank data available. And from the biobank data, you can also generate the genetic data. So many EHR data have now linked their patients' clinical data, which are the ICD codes, lab tests, and other clinical diagnosis with their genetic data. So the biobank linked EHR data can be similarly used to perform a PRS analysis. And the only kind of different, not only, the one of the uh, major difference is in GWAS, you normally have just one phenotype and one genetic data. And with the EHR, you actually have tens and hundreds of phenotypes link with the genetic data. But in terms of developing PRS, they can work similarly as well. And so I'm going to introduce some of the data I've used for this analysis. So first is uh, the electronic, electronic medical records and genomics data, which is called eMERS. So the eMERS data is a consortium of multiple hospitals and health 
centers in the US to emerge pools all of this data together to give you a large, larger data set. And the larger data set have patients' phenotype data and the genetic data. And one advantage of eMERGE data is it not only gives you the phenotype data as in the ICD codes, but the eMERGE also develop phenotyping algorithms that combines the ICD codes, the lab tests, and sometimes the doctors kind of handwritten notes together to determine the patient's phenotype. So the phenotype in the eMERGE are higher quality than just compared to the ICD-9 codes or ICD-10 codes itself. And the second data set I use is Pan Medicine Biobank or PNBB. So PNBB is generated by the University of Pennsylvania. So the, uh, the university recruited around 60,000 people uh, who visited the University of Pennsylvania health systems. And uh, so far, a subset of the 60,000 patients have uh, generated their genetic data. So I use a subset of this data for my analysis. Then finally, I uh, haven't used this data yet, but I plan to use this for my analysis. It's the UK Biobank data. Uh, yesterday, some presenters have uh, introduced this data already. So the UK Biobank data have around 500,000 participants. It's not a, an EHR data, but it's an EHR-like data. So it has both the patients uh, kind of phenotype data and also the genetic data. And this is publicly available upon request. And it's one of the largest kind of biobank linked EHR data available uh, for research. So next we want to uh, develop this PRS or PRV in the EHR. So in one of our recent reviews, we discussed some of the ways we can develop PRS in the EHR. Uh, we showed five uh, different ways here. And the first and the most common way, so first we assume you have access to one or multiple biobank linked EHR data. So you have to have genetic data with your EHR. So the first and the most commonly used way is to use the external GWAS summary stats and apply it to your EHR, EHR data. So this is the most what everyone is doing to obtain the GWAS summary stats, for example, from the uh, GWAS catalog and apply it to your EHR data, you can calculate a PRS score. And the second approach is what we use in this analysis is to use your own EHR data to generate the PRS. So you use a subset of patients to develop the association statistics and apply to that to an independent subset of data the patients to construct the PRS. And then you can evaluate the PRS on the subset of um, the independent subset of data. So there are pros and cons for both this approach. So for this approach, if you have a well, uh, qual high quality GWAS data with large sample size, uh, it's very straightforward to use uh, the external summary staff to your EHR data. But the limitation of that approach is sometimes the phenotype you want to study don't have a corresponding GWAS summary stats, so you can't use that information. And in our case, because we want additive, uh, dominance and recessive summary stats, and it's typically not available in the external GWAS, so we can't use the external GWAS. Another reason is uh, there could be different characteristics of the patients between your own data and the external data. So UK Biobank data, which is a commonly used source for GWAS summary stats, have patients between age 40 and uh, 69. But in the PMBB data and EMERS data, we have many patients that are outside of this range. So that's just one example how your EHR data is different from the external data. So it might be, sometimes it might be uh, useful to use your own data to generate the PRS because your own pop patient's population are more similar between your training data and the testing data. And the third approach could be uh, you combine the external GWAS and with your internal EHR data to get a, like a combined uh, beta coefficients for to generate PRS. And you could also use another EHR to generate the summary stats and apply to your own EHR. And then finally, you could also average across uh, multiple EHRs. So if you want more information about PRS and EHR, you can check out uh, our recent review paper. So yeah, our, this analysis, we use the second approach. 
So this is the experimental setup. So as I mentioned before, we divide the data into uh, 10 different folds and we use nine of the 10 folds as a training data to obtain the GWAS uh, summary stats. Then we apply the summary stats to the remaining one fold uh, of which is the testing data. And we repeat the process 10 times to get a consistent, to verify the consistency of the results in both the eMERGE and the PMBB. Then finally, we compare their prediction accuracies between the PRB and the PRS. And the phenotypes we use in this study are the three phenotypes, heart failure, type 2 diabetes, and abdominal aortic aneurysms. And the reason we chose these three phenotypes is uh, PMBB data are more cardiovascular focused, at least initially. We have a lot of cardiovascular disease patients, so that's why we pick the phenotypes that are related to the cardiovascular diseases. And we, um, we also found the corresponding phenotypes in the eMERGE data. So we want to have kind of validation between the two, uh, two data sets. So these are the three data sets we chose. And these are the number of case controls for each of these uh, data sets. And in when developed PRS, it's typical to use a p-value threshold to select the SNPs. And we tried multiple p-value thresholds. And uh, here, I'm just going to show you the results from one of the thresholds. So I'm going to go through this figure. So the top panel is uh, the eMERGE data. And the bottom panel is the pain medicine and bio bank data, or PMBB. And each of the panel is a different phenotype. So here, I, what I'm showing is under this PW threshold, around uh, 6,000 SNPs were selected for this phenotype under the additive uh, genetic model. So that's the typical model we use for GWAS analysis. And a similar number of SNPs were selected under the dominant model. And a smaller number of SNPs are, were uh, selected for the recessive model. So this trend is generally true for all phenotypes. So the additive and dominant model have the most number of SNPs under the same p-value threshold, and the recessive uh, model has a smaller number of SNPs. Uh, except for this one, so for this phenotype in the PMBB, actually have a larger number of recessive SNPs. And the reason could be there is a smaller number of cases for this phenotype, so the association may not be as good as the other phenotypes. But this is just the general trend holds uh, for, for, for the other phenotypes. So next we want to see, so after we select the SNPs, we generate the polygen risk scores under the different genetic models. So next we want to see whether uh, there are any correlations between the different PRSs. So this is from the eMERGE data. Um, what we did here is for each of the phenotype, we look at the correlations between the three sets of the PRS. So the diagonal uh, line is 100% because it's a correlation between the PRS itself. And what we see here is that recessive PRS have very low correlation with the additive and dominant, but the additive and dominant have a similar correlation, uh, have a higher correlation between each other. And this, this is true for uh, kind of all the phenotypes. And for the PMBB data, uh, the tr trend is generally the same, except for the heart failure, where we have uh, an overall higher correlations between all the phenotypes, but the uh, recessive still have a lower correlation with the other uh, PRSs. So from this, we think there could be independent uh, predictive signals from the different polygenic risk scores because their risk scores have a low correlation or at least a lower correlation with the additive. Uh, then we look at how the, uh, how the performance of PRV compared to PRS in terms of their accuracy. Uh, so this is a similar structure as the previous slide. So the top panel is for the eMERGE data, the bottom is for the pen bio bank. Uh, so just focus on this panel right now. So the y-axis is a testing AUC. So because we did 10 full cross-validation, so we have 10 numbers, so that's about box plot. So we compare the accuracy of PRV against the PRS, and the accuracy is significantly better 
with the PRV than the PRS. So we use this, use the one-sided non-parametric test here. And similarly, in the PMBB data, the PRV also have higher performance than the PRS, which is additive. So for the heart failure, uh, it's not significantly better, so it's slightly better, but not, not did not reach significance. And for the PMBB data, it reached significance uh, level of 0.05. And for type 2 diabetes, uh, it's also better, but it's not significantly better. And for the PMP data, it's significantly better. And the conclusion from, I think, from this result is that PRV performed at least equal or better than PRS. And it performs uh, better than the other PRS generated under the dominant and the recessive model. So it, it doesn't perform worse in any of the uh, real data analysis. Uh, the next, this is a common kind of figure for PRS. So on the X axis, instead of looking at the raw risk scores or PRVs, we look at the percentile of the scores. So we con converted the scores into different percentiles. And the Y axis is the percentage of cases corresponding to each percentile. So if a risk score performs well, we will expect a upward trend. So with the lower percentile scores, we expect a lower percentage of cases. And with the higher percentile scores, we expect a higher percentage of cases. So in all of these phenotypes, we did see an upward trend, which is good. And we see that the PRV, which is the blue line, performed slightly better than the PRS in terms of this percentile versus number of cases. Uh, so from this result, we think we show that the PRV actually performs equal, at least good, as good or better than the PRS. Uh, so in summary, uh, I think we showed it's equal and better. And we also think there could be predictive features contained in other genetic models other than the additive models. And there could be other ways to improve the PRS. So what we show here is kind of a simple ongoing work to uh, develop a PRV. Uh, in our other papers, we also showed uh, instead of using the p-value threshold to select the SNPs, we could also use the accuracy-based metrics to select the SNP. So you don't use a p-value, but use like something like AUC or R square to select the SNPs, and we show that it actually perform better than using a p-value threshold. And what we want to do next is further validations in other independent EHR data sets, for example, UK Valbank or maybe some other potential EHR data sets. Uh, so I want to thank my mentor, Jason Moore, Dr. Jason Moore and Ying Chen, and my collaborators for the project. And if you have questions, you can email me or Twitter. If you follow me, I'll follow you back. I'm just new on the Twitter, so I'm a very small number of followers. <laughs> All right, thank you. I will take any questions. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, excellent work. Uh, so I have so many questions. Um, so I'm going to monitor the chat box here, but I'm going to start out and ask you. So the Penn Biobank, um, which I'm very jealous about, um, is also known um, not just for being a biobank, but also for being a diverse biobank, right? Um, and I know the eMERGE network can be diverse depending on the study site you're looking at. So um, what did you do with that diversity in your study? I, I didn't, did you limit it to one population or did you try to leverage diversity or what was going on there? Yeah, so for this analysis, I only focus on the European population. We do have some African uh, samples, but the number of samples is still not high enough. They are still generating the genetic data for the African population. So I haven't used that for this analysis, but uh, that's something I would plan to do in the future. And also because of validation, I want to have a comparable population between eMERGE and uh, PANDAL. And so I, haven't, I started with the European population. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question here from Jonathan Haynes. Um, while AUC is commonly used, is it really the best measure for a PRS, PRV? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So uh, that's a commonly used metric for uh, PRS and P, uh, PRS so far, at least. Uh, so I, I think there could be other ways to look at the 
performance of PRS. So last plot, I showed the quantile versus number of cases. That's another way to look at the performance of the PRS. But there could be definitely other ways. For example, if you just look at the sensitivity or the specificity, you could have other metrics. So I think right now, uh, the way to evaluate or even calculate PRS is still not decided. There's no, not a common standard. And it's still, you could try many different ways to develop or evaluate PRS. I think that's an ongoing kind of research direction for the PRS or PRB. And Jonathan, did you have a follow-up question on that? I, I did actually. So, um, and, and you're right, AUC is, is the commonly used, but depending on what you want to use the PRS for, it may or may not be a, a, a decent measure. You can have an, a really, really high AUC that is totally useless if you're trying to do prediction, for example, because so much of that depends on prevalence. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, and this is not a criticism of you so much as the field. I think we really need to be looking uh, more broadly at what, why are you doing this? What are you going to use it for? And what's the best measure uh, depending on what you're looking at? Yeah, 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 I agree with that. <laughs> so we have another question here in the chat box from, and I'm probably gonna mispronounce the name here, Wee Chun Zhu. Um, the questions are, what data source do you use to obtain the recessive PRS components? And what could be the reason for the higher correlation between additive and recessive PRS in the Penn Biobank compared with eMERGE? Yeah, so data source is I use my, the, own EHR data. So I use cross validation. So I use a subset of my own data to generate the recessive PRS, then apply it to an independent set. So I didn't use external data because this is not generally not available externally. So I use my own data. And the reason for car correlation, I think one of the reasons is because for that particular phenotype, there's a very small number of cases. So the results may not, I, may not be as well as the, uh, the other ones. So I would actually expect the, the correlation between the recessive and the additive are smaller. I think in that particular case, the additive and recessive are not higher. It's just higher in general, but it's not higher than the dominant and the additive. It's just higher. In, uh, I, I think that's why like the recessive still have a lower correlation than with the additive or the dominant. I think that's from the slide, yeah. And um, I did have a question. I feel like I'm channeling Scott Williams, who I think is on here. But um, I wanted to know if you're um, the vector. So you've done additive, dominant, uh, recessive, um, and, and commendable, because we, as you said, we only use additive most of the time, right? Um, but can you expand it, or, or can you envision ex expanding it to include epistasis? Or yeah, I, I thought about that. Epistasis. So. Uh, it's definitely possible, so it doesn't hurt to, because the, uh, this is a talking about prediction, so we don't suffer from the multiple testing uh, adjustments, so we could add as many as long as they're informative. And I haven't done that because the, the search space is much larger, so I, 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 it's, uh, maybe the next stage, if this works with the additive and dominant and recessive, then I can start to look at epistasis but the time to calculate the epistasis is much larger, so I haven't tried it at first. So it's definitely possible to have that information as well. Cool. Um, oh, and Scott Williams has a follow-up. Okay. Two things. One is, with respect to that, you have large enough sample sizes, you don't even have to explicitly test for epistasis. You can partition or stratify your analysis by different subgroups if you think they're interacting. Okay. The other thing is that the problem I've always had with the PRS, and this I could have asked yesterday, has to do with the beta values are assumed based on the GWAS. And they're, it's not very clear how trans, you, you can force them into a model and say, well, we got this prediction, but they're not necessarily accurate across populations or across other exposures. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I mean, you, you throw it all in because you have a beta, but the point is, you know, if you're, if you're looking at very diverse populations, those betas may be very, very different. It may even flip direction. Yeah. So I think that's one uh, reason we kind of, in that review paper, we said 
use your own EHR data to generate the beta. So across your own EHR data, between the uh, patients who train the uh, GWAS beta and the patients you want to apply to the uh, beta are more similar to each other. So that's, I think, one advantage of the EHR data. Uh, instead of using external GWAS, which may or may not be similar to your own data. So that's, I think that's one advantage with the EHR data is you can use your own data to, with a large, larger not sample size, you can generate your own beta values and for, for future evaluations. But can I kind of follow up on that? Because in fact, you know, in Penn, the Penn Biobank, it's what, like 40% African-American. So if you, if you estimate a beta value from that biobank, it may not be the same in the African-American component as this from the European or Asian components. So do you average across all the, or do you, or you how do you do the analysis to generate those beta, even from your own EHR? Mm. Uh, so I think from our own EHR, I'll, we'll just apply to our own patients from the pen. So we are, I, I guess at this stage, we're not looking to apply to the African population in Europe. So just use our own EHR, African population in our own EHR and apply to the African population also in our own EHR. So hopefully they're more similar to each other because they're from the same kind of location, uh, which is Philadelphia. Yeah. In terms of, there, we haven't thought of a good method, methodology way to account for this, uh, but just in terms of analysis, I think this is the thing we can do is to limit our sample to be as homogeneous as possible between the training and the testing data. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, so next up, our second speaker is, um, she is uh, Kira Atkins, and she is actually a graduate student uh, in biomedical sciences at Vanderbilt University Medical Center as part of the Vanderbilt Meharry Medical College Alliance. Um, I, sh I should also like to note that she um, is a very active member of the American Society of Human Genetics. She's a member of the new uh, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm going to share my slides. Well, I'm really excited to be talking with you all today. So I first wanna thank the organizers for inviting me here to talk with you about the research we've been doing on polycystic ovary syndrome, especially since today marks the very first day of PCOS Awareness Month. So PCOS is the most common endocrine disorder in females, and it's actually one of the leading causes of infertility. And so it's very complex because there's both a genetic component as well as an environment component to PCOS. And the main symptoms of PCOS are polycystic ovarian morphology, which is um, polycystic ovaries, which means there's an excess number of follicles within the ovaries that aren't being released during ovulation. There are also irregular menstruation cycles that could be a direct result of polycystic ovarian morphology. And one of the other main symptoms of PCOS is hyperandrogenism. And so instead of having higher levels of estrogen, um, females with PCOS can have higher levels of androgens such as testosterone. And this can lead to things like acne due to the hormonal imbalance, um, hirsutism, which means excess hair over the body, or alopecia, which is like thinning hair or male pattern baldness at the crown. So because of this heterogeneous um, nature of PCOS and the symptoms and how it varies across women who have the disease, there's actually a lot of um, dissatisfaction in how PCOS is diagnosed. And so in a recent survey about diagnosis experience, one third of women actually reported that diagnosis took over two years and seeing over three or more healthcare professionals. Now, one of the reasons that might be why it's so difficult to diagnose PCOS is because that there are multiple diagnostic criteria. The first one was actually created in 1990 by the National Institutes of Health, and this is commonly referred to as the NIH criteria. And this may be surprising to you all, but it actually only requires that females have a regular menstruation or hyperandrogenism to be diagnosed. 
For a long time, this was the only criteria in place for PCOS until 2003 when the European Society for Reproduction and Human Embryology and the American Society Productive Medicine held their conference in Rotterdam, Netherlands. So this criteria is usually referred to as the Rotterdam criteria. And so they felt that the NIH criteria was way too narrow and restrictive and that they needed to broaden the current diagnostic criteria. And so this criteria actually requires that women have at least two or more of the three symptoms here. There's actually a third criteria that was created in 2006 by the Androgen Excess and PCOS Society. And so they, in their guidelines, said that the main culprit of PCOS is hyperandrogenism, and it must be seen in patients in order to be diagnosed, along with ovulatory dysfunction, which could either be polycystic ovaries or regular administration. So as you might be able to tell from the um, slides that all women with PCOS are not the same and that it can vary along what we call the PCOS clinical spectrum. And so women can have anywhere from a mild phenotype of PCOS based on their symptoms to a severe phenotype. And unfortunately, um, as it stands now, the criteria in place don't capture all of these women. It only captures a subset, which usually tends to be more on the extreme side of the spectrum. And that has led to an estimation of up to 75% of women remaining undiagnosed with PCOS. Another reason why it might be such a high number that you see here is because of the comorbidities that are commonly seen with a PCOS diagnosis. The most common one is insulin resistance, and actually up to 70% of women who have PCOS are believed to have this. Another common comorbidity is type 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, as well as neuropsychiatric diseases like depression and anxiety, as well as cancer like endometrial cancer. Because there's such a high rate of undiagnosis and because these comorbidities are usually metabolic in nature, it makes high risk groups especially more vulnerable to a PCOS diagnosis, especially when that can exacerbate other conditions like the ones you see before you. This includes African-American women who have a greater risk of metabolic syndrome, which is a um, term to describe a cluster of phenotypes that are metabolic um, disorders, such as hypertension, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and an abnormal lipid profile. This also includes Hispanic women who have a higher prevalence of hyperglycemia, as well as been shown to have a more severe metabolic profile um, in women who have PCOS. So our goal um, at Meharry and Vanderbilt is to study PCOS and to characterize the etiology of the disorder. And the way that we're doing it is very much similar to the first speaker of today's presentation, is using electronic health records. So Vanderbilt has what they call the synthetic derivative, which is the um, Vanderbilt EHR database, and it holds over 3 million records, and it's a de-identified mirror image of the medical records that clinicians use during routine checkups. So these records have a wealth of information that can be used to study many different disorders. Um, one of the more common ones that are used are what's known as billing codes. Um, these billing codes are what's used for insurance purposes, and there are two different versions within the EHR known as ICD-9 and ICD-10. There are also procedural codes known as CPT. There are also in the clinical notes, which are an unstructured text format of the patient visit. There are also things like medication information as well as lab and test results. So we're using this information in order to study how the comorbidities of PCOS persist in different populations. But in order to do that, we first had to create a data set of women who had PCOS. And because it's so difficult to diagnose PS PCOS, we created an algorithm that had varying criteria to see which one of those data sets actually best represented true PCOS cases. We first started out with the SD, um, which has over 3 million records, and then we filtered that down to females between the ages of 11 to 44 to really enrich our data set for individuals within that reproductive period. 
We then excluded uh, females who had at least one of the many exclusion codes, and this includes disorders that can affect the endocrine system or has um, PCOS-like symptoms. And so PCOS is a disorder based on excluding of other disorders. These disorders include things like pituitary, tumors, or things that can affect the um, menstruation cycle, like um, eating disorders or opioid use. We created our control set using these criteria. And so our control set doesn't have any of the exclusion codes, nor do they have any of our PCOS inclusion codes. For the individuals that do, they go into a pool known as our eligible PCOS case. And so from that, we created our first data set using this specific criteria. And this criteria is a very um, stringent criteria because we required that they either have polycystic ovaries um, based on ICD code or irregular menstruation ICD codes and inheritatism ICD code, which is our proxy for hyperandrogenism. We also required a um, PCOS keyword phrase within their clinical notes. And for the individuals that met this criteria, they were known as our keyword strict um, data set. We then relaxed that criteria by, instead of including a regular menstruation and um, heresitism ICD codes, we instead created um, a OR criteria. Again, we also required the presence of a PCS keyword within their clinical notes. And then this became our keyword broad criteria. We did the same thing, but instead of using, we then removed the keyword aspect from our algorithm. And the one that had the AND criteria became our coded strict criteria. And then we had a coded broad data set as well. So these are the results of that algorithm development. And you can see that the coded broad algorithm had the most um, number of individuals within that data set. And then the number then became smaller as the algorithms became more stringent. And this was seen across the three different um, racial groups that we looked at, which are white, African American, and Hispanic. I also wanted to show the prevalence of PCOS within our EHR database. And because we have such a large database, um, PCOS is not um, enriched in this particular data set. But because the prevalence of PCOS ranges from as low to 5% to as high as 21% based on the diagnostic criteria used and based on the sample analyzed, I did want to pinpoint that um, the prevalence between races don't vary that much. So we validated these algorithms through manual chart review um, using a set of criteria that allowed us to see if these women truly had a PCOS diagnosis. We also performed positive predictive value on a random sample of 50 charts from each of these data sets. And this tells us how well our algorithm is good at identifying true PCOS cases. Unfortunately, our coded broad criteria um, is the worst performing algorithm, and it's because it picked up a lot of false um, positives due that, to that OR requirement. However, by including the AND requirement with irregular menstruation and heresitism, we see a drastic improvement with the coded strict algorithm. And we can see that um, the coded strict, keyword broad, and keyword strict did perform very well. For our comorbidity analysis, which I'll be talking about a little bit later, we did use coded strict as our PCOS data set. And it's because it not only has the best positive predictive value, it also has the biggest number of PCOS cases. So in order to do our polygenic risk score comorbidity analysis, we use what we call um, BioView, which is a subset of the SD. And this particular subset is a um, collection of individuals who have available DNA samples that can be genotyped. We have two specific genotype samples, um, a European descent sample, as well as an African descent sample. As you can see, we have way more people in our European descent sample than our African descent sample. 
but I specifically wanted to pinpoint the number of PCOS cases within each one. So we have a fraction of females who actually do have genotype samples who were identified within our co-district algorithm. So I'm sure if you, like the first presenter said, he did a really good job of talking about what a polygenic risk score is. And just in summary, it is a score that is based off of um, GWAS summary statistics. I specifically wanted to focus on the GWAS data set that we use. And so we use the summary statistics from the Day at All um, PCOS study in 2018. And I'm showing here the Manhattan plot on this slide. And I specifically wanted to pinpoint that a number of the GWAS or genome-wide significant SNPs are SNPs that are related to um, reproductive genes. On this side of the figure, I wanted to also show that an example of what these polygenic risk scores might look like within our BioView set. And so those with a higher polygenic risk score, such as this person with the four, will have a higher risk for PCOS. So we genetically validated our data set by doing a logistic regression between the PCOS PRS and our PCOS case status based on each of the data sets. We adjusted for sex, median age, as well as um, genetic ancestry. And we use both the European and African set, and we can see that the three data sets that had the best performing PPV um, were significantly associated with PCOS PRS. Um, even though the African descent sample have very large confidence intervals, I do want to also show that the point estimates were larger than the European set. So we then and took the polygenic risk scores for um, PCOS, and then we performed a phenome-wide association study, which allows us to see what phenotypes within our medical phenome are associated with a high polygenic risk score for PCOS. And the results I'm going to show you look very similar to this figure here, where we have um, other disease categories on the x-axis the p-values on the y-axis, and then we have the phenotypes that are significantly associated with in the plot. So those that are at the higher end of this plot will be more significantly associated if they pass the red line, which marks um, Barfroni correction, and then the blue line marks um, a 0.05 p-value. So we first performed this analysis within our European descent set, and you can see here that we have a number of different significant associations, with the top being um, diabetes. And this particular analysis was performed on our sex combined um, data set, so this did include both females and males. We adjusted for sex, median age, as well as genetic ancestry. And we see a spike of cardiovascular disorders, as well as polycystic ovaries. And so these arrows represent each of the phenotypes in our medical phenome. And if it's pointed upwards, it means that there is an increased risk. And if it's pointed downwards, that means that there is a decreased risk for that disease. When we perform the sex stratified analysis in females, we see that the top three significant associations are diabetes and polycystic ovaries, which is a good thing because it kind of is a proof of concept analysis that tells us that our PCOS PRS is actually predicting a symptom of PCOS. When we performed it in males, we see that there is a spike of circulatory phenotypes. And so we see things like hypertension and hypertensive heart disease, as well as diabetes. When we performed this analysis within our African descent sample, we did not see any significant associations. And we believe this is because the analysis is underpowered. We don't have um, enough individuals to really analyze the PCOS PRS within this group. Um, but I did want to show some of the phenotypes, the top phenotypes, that passed um, a 0.05 p-value.
So in summary, we were able to show that including multiple sets of criteria actually improves the accuracy of identifying true PCS cases within um, electronic health records. Um, we also showed that a polygenic risk score is significantly associated with PCOS case status and both our European and African descent females. We also saw that there is genetic pleiotropy between PCOS and some of the comorbidities, specifically with type 2 diabetes and some cardiovascular diseases. So polygenic risk scores can serve as a way to improve diagnostic accuracy of PCOS. Um, there, of course, is a lot of work to be done before it can be implemented clinically, um, and as well as there is a lot of work to be done in order to um, study this within multiple diverse populations. Um, the PCOS GWAS summary statistics that we use was performed in a European descent population. Um, so the PCOS consortium is working on getting that analysis done in um, an African descent population, which will be better at predicting in an African target population. It also serves as a very unique way to study the genetic contributions of PCOS in males, since they can't be studied uh, phenotypically. So with that, I just would like to acknowledge um, my amazing lab who have been a great help in this project um, and all of the collaborators that have helped on this PCS project and our funding. And I would also like to thank you all for your time and attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kira. Um, so I'll monitor the chat box. Um, uh, oh, I see there's a, there's a question already. Um, so, so this is Miriam. I may have missed your future plan. What is your plan for obtaining more data for African populations? <laughs> yeah, um, so more data is always the better choice. We don't have to my knowledge, any plans at the moment. That was actually the biggest pool that was done recently is that 15,000. Um, so I think just over time, we're gonna be working on, you know, additional samples that weren't already genotyped, but hopefully as time goes on, more and more people are going to opt in into the BioView program um, and supply some you know, of remaining DNA that can be a genotype for additional purposes. So I definitely see that increasing over the years. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge, I think, for anybody that's interested in diversity uh, and genomics, unfortunately. Um, so I, I did have a question uh, related maybe uh, more phenotypically at the algorithm. Uh, so those of us that work in electronic health records and, and computable phenotyping, we feel your pain. Um, and uh, so I, what, I think one, um, criticism we, we get with working with electronic health records or clinical populations is, you know, they're not representative of the general population. But I think even more so with a phenotype like yours, it seems like there are different criteria depending on the study. And I'm looking at day at all in the table of the studies included there. So like 23andMe self-report versus something that you did. So can, can you compare and contrast for us in general, like what were the age distribution similar or what are the striking differences or similarities um, and how would that impact um, some of the analyses that you're trying to do when you're trying to generate data for uh, polygenic risk scores? Yeah, so um, specifically one difference within our genotype sample is that our African descent population is like a, on average 10 years younger than our European descent population. I'm not sure if that's going to have any big effect on um, generating polygenic risk scores, but like you were saying, there is a lot of differences in identifying these groups, and I think that might affect um, how the polygenic risk scores are generated. So the PCOS um, some tests that we used for this analysis did actually use NIH and Rotterdam criteria, but if there are multiple GWAS some sets in the future on PCOS that vary in criteria, then it can definitely have different effects on a target population that also use different diagnostic criteria. And so 
we're the as a field are trying to figure out a, the, what's the best way to diagnose women with PCOS and unfortunately you sometimes have to use the data that you have some um, EHR databases may not have as you know much information like lab data to identify their samples some may only have things like self-reported data which might be the case for um, you know a different EHR data set so it's it's definitely it's a very tricky phenotype to study I think what's striking with the analysis that we did um, kind of comes down to that genetic validation and how the point estimates were a little bit higher than the European descent sample. And so that of course can change if there is, if we use the GWAS set done in an African descent or African American population. So I'm very interested to see how that moves forward within the field. But, you know, it's definitely just something that we're still working on trying to figure out, like there was new guidelines put in place in 2018. So this is definitely something that we're still working on. Yeah, that's always challenging when new guidelines are introduced and then you have um, a long history in your electronic health record to try to figure out like <laughs> when people were diagnosed with what guidelines. Yeah. And clinicians can use any of the three or any of the newer ones that may come out in the future. So it's really subjective. And I'm assuming um, this was um, a, a variety of clinics that these patients were um, seeing. It's not a specialty clinic um, that you were drawing from in BioView. Yeah, no, BioView is both like Vanderbilt University Medical Center as well as several different clinics surrounding Nashville. And so, yeah, we don't get specific information about where those individuals come from because it's de identified. So it can be anywhere it can be for anything a lot of women do come in for things like an irregular administration cycle and trying to figure out what like why that's occurring into finding that they have pcos um, and then might get later treatment for it but yeah we kind of get people from everywhere <laughs> okay great um so are there any other questions from the audience uh, in the chat box no, I just want to point out that we ha our speaker from yesterday that could not be with us. Uh, she's actually listening while driving. Be careful. Um, so Athena uh, Starlin Davenport, and she just wanted to say hi to everybody. She was um, regretful that she could not be there yesterday, but she's listening in now. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So I want to thank you, Kira, for the talk. Thank you. And uh, we'll go ahead and bring up our next talk. So this year is our first year. We're going to do uh, a trainee spotlight from Case Western Reserve University. So this year is Anna Miller, and she is a graduate student in genetics and genome sciences here at Case. Great, thank you, Dana, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation today to be the first uh, trainees uh, spotlight. I'm really excited to share this story that I started working on very early in my PhD when I first joined Dr. Scott Williams' lab here at Case Western, where we're studying the association of preeclampsia with infant APOL1 genotype in African Americans. Preeclampsia is a hypertensive disorder and a complication of pregnancy, which is measured by diastolic blood pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury or higher, systolic blood pressure of 140 milliliters of mercury or higher, and the presence of proturnia or high levels of protein in urine, as well as other organ dysfunction. Preeclampsia is a complex phenotype that has a wide variety of symptoms that include headaches that don't go away, changes in vision like blurriness, trouble breathing, pain in the upper right belly area or the shoulder, nausea, sudden weight gain, and swelling in the legs, hands, or face to name a few. Preeclampsia, as well as other comorbidities involving pregnancy, occur more frequently in women of African ancestry, where African American women are three times more likely to die from preeclampsia than European American women. Like preeclampsia, chronic kidney disease, or CKD, is more prevalent in African Americans. There are two known polymorphisms in the APOL1 gene, G1 and G2, 
which are associated with an increased risk of chronic kidney disease under a recessive mode of inheritance. There are three SNPs that correspond to two AP001 um, genotypes. The first two are in um, the G1 genotype, which is a substitution. These two SNPs are in nearly absolute linkage disequilibrium. Therefore, our current study and previous studies have only chosen to study one of these two SNPs, only sequenced one of these SNPs. The G2 allele, the second um, genotype, is a polymorphism of six base pair deletion. Here we have the domain structure of the ABLE on um, protein to show that the, there's a relatively small distance between these three SNPs. About 10% of Africans carry an APOL1 polymorphism with an allele frequency of about 20% in, um, or as high as 20% in countries such as Ghana and Nigeria. African Americans report an allele frequency of 10% or higher, while European Americans have allele frequency of less than 1%. This APOL1 um, gene is better known as the tryptolanic factor, as it provides innate immunity against tryptomanosoma brucey brucey infection, which is also known as sleeping sickness. And in this disease, it is under a dominant mode of inheritance. Therefore, overall, polymorphisms are selected for um, in regions where there are high rates of sleeping sickness, specifically when looking at Africa. APOL1 um, is expressed most predominantly in the liver, where we see that APOL1 is secreted to kill tryptomatosomes, but it is also expressed in other tissues, one of which being in the kidney, hence um, increased risk of chronic kidney disease, as well as in the placenta. In a prior study performed by our collaborators, APOL1 genotype was studied in regards to chronic kidney disease, um, and transgenic mice were created using these APOL1 mutations that I previously described. The goal of this study was to understand the function of APOL1 in regards to homeostatic and pathogenic processes. As a result of this study, they found that mice developed preeclamptic phenotypes if the pup, not the mother, so the infant, had the APOL1 polymorphism. Therefore, this indicates that APOL1 um, is expressed by the fetus or the placenta and is therefore triggering this um, preeclamptic phenotype. The mode of inheritance in this disease is unknown, unknown and unclear at this time, as we've seen um, in other diseases involving APOL1, both a recessive and a dominant model. A prior study performed by Reddy et al. measured the association of fetal and maternal APOL1 HR, or high-risk, genotype on preeclampsia. They used two different study populations, the EMC case-only study as well as the UTHSC case control study. Both of these populations um, had both cases and controls that were only Black women. The fetal APOL1 high-risk genotype was associated with preeclampsia um, in both study sites with odds ratios of 1.84 and 1.92 respectively. Maternal APOL1 high-risk genotype was not associated with preeclampsia in either study. They concluded that the fetal APOL1 high-risk genotype increases the risk for preeclampsia, likely by um, adversely affecting the placental function. Nonetheless, future research is needed to assess whether APOL1 genetic testing can predict preeclampsia and improve pregnancy outcomes in this population, as well as how it interacts with other uh, preeclamptic predictor factors, such as environmental factors of weight and age, the effects of racism, and other genetic factors. In our study, we studied placental tissues from black women in the Cleveland area to further study the association between preeclampsia and APOL1 risk alleles in the infant. We also assessed correlation between APOL1 risk alleles and placental pathology from the mother. These samples were selected from the Ohio March of Dimes um, Biobank, which is a 10-year collection of singleton pregnancies, meaning one pregnancy per mother. In this biobank, they collected placentas, umbilical cords, and fetal membranes. Our study cohort was limited to women who self-identified as African-American as APOL1 decreases the risk of sleeping sickness um, and therefore is selected for G1 and G2 alleles in this population. 
Additionally, APOL1 risk factors are only found, um, or risk variants, excuse me, are only found in individuals of African ancestry. This study included both preterm and term uh, births. Control individuals also self-identified as black women, but in this case, they all had full-term pregnancies with no history of preeclampsia or any other placental condition. Summary statistics were performed for maternal risk factors, pathological features, and APOL1 genotype by clinical com category, comparing each clinical category to term controls. Clinical categories included all preeclamptic cases, stratifying by term status. We also had looking at term preeclamptic cases. We further stratified by severity of preeclampsia, looking at term preeclamptic severe and term preeclamptic not otherwise specified. Severe preeclampsia in, is defined as blood pressure of greater than 160 over 110 millimeters of mercury, as well as proternia or any other um, organ dysfunction. The other categories included preterm preeclamptic cases and once again, um, preterm preeclamptic severe and preterm preeclamptic not otherwise specified. Adjusted and unadjusted models um, of logistic regression were used to assess the association between APOL1 variants and all preeclamptic cases, as well as their clinical subtypes as described to the left. A forward stepwise selection procedure was used to determine the clinical and pathological variables that were included in the adjusted models as well as the validity of these variables from the definition of preeclampsia um, were all considered in model building. Finally, pathological features were tested for association with APOL1 by chi-square and ANOVA for categorical and continuous variables, respectively. The study population consisted of 395 cases and 282 control pregnancies. There was a significant difference between controls and cases when looking at maternal age and graffiti. As expected for births complicated by preeclampsia, there's a significant difference in gestational age, birth weight, and placental weight. Both term and preterm cases had significantly lower birth weights. When looking at placental weights, um, controls and ca term cases were similar, but preterm cases were significantly lower. Finally, the fetal placental weight ratio, which is an indicator for placental efficacy, was significantly lower in both preterm and term cases. In an unadjusted logistic regression model, the association of APOL1 genotype with all preeclamped cases was measured for dominant, additive, and recessive modes of inheritance. Model one of all preeclamptic cases um, were significant under the dominant model with odds ratios of 1.36 to 1.44, while they were not significant under the additive or the recessive model. The three additional models were analyzed as a result of the stepwise regression as described earlier. Models were once again examined for dominant, recessive, and additive modes of inheritance. And the first model, model one, adjusted for maternal age as a continuous variable. Maternal age um, increases the risk of preeclampsia um, as women's age, where they see that women aged 40 and older have a twofold rate of preeclampsia. Model two adjusted for maternal age and villa's architecture maturity, which describes the state of development of the placenta, where we see that maturity can coincide with preterm and term status. The final model that we looked at was model three, which adjusted for maternal age and Vivilla's architecture maturity as before, as well as for gravidity. Gravidity is um, defined as the number of times a woman has been pregnant. This does not mean it was a successful pregnancy. Prior studies had associated gravidity with hypertensive disorders um, in pregnancy in general. All three of these models were significant looking at all cases in only the dominant model, with odds ratios around 1.4.
Cases were then further stratified by prematurity as well as severity of preeclampsia. And we're um, associated looking at all three of the different models as described before. Under the dominant mode of inheritance, preterm cases were significant in model one, trended towards significant in model two, and was not significant in model three. Now looking under a recessive mode of inheritance, we see that preterm cases were not significant in model one, but were in models two and three. Similarly, under the additive model, we see that preterm cases, as notated here in red, were significant under model one in model two, but not in model three. For term preeclamptic cases, no association was significant in any of the models under any mode of inheritance, even when stratified by severity of preeclampsia. In all of these unadjusted models, we see that the inclusion of variables selected by stepwise regression and prior knowledge had minimal effect on the odds ratios. Finally, pathological features were also analyzed for, by mode of inheritance of the APOL1 alleles. There were no features that associated with any inheritance pattern by case age alone. Here we see gestational age, which was significantly different by cases and controls. Looking at these first two columns here, we see a significant difference between these two groups. But they were not significantly different based on APOL1 genotype, where red dots represent an, inf an infant that has no risk alleles, blue dots are an infant with one risk allele, and the yellow dots are an infant with two risk alleles. Therefore, looking across clinical categories, we see that there is no noticeable difference between um, the APOL1 genotype of each group. Overall, APOL1 risk alleles are associated with different modes of inheritance, which was seen as chronic kidney disease is a recessive mode of inheritance and protection against tryptomanosomes is dominant. Our study found that APOL1 was associated under a dominant model for all cases and a recessive model looking at preterm cases alone. It is possible that the mechanism involving APOL1 genotype is different between preterm and term cases. Therefore, additional studies need to be performed looking at both African populations as well as African American populations to further establish the inheritance pattern for preeclampsia. Our observations are consistent with the prior study, Ready et al. However, they did not look at a dominant mode of inheritance for any of their studies. Therefore, we found a dominant mode of inheritance as the most significant, but they only looked at recessive. Nonetheless, our preterm preeclamptic cases were significant for a recessive inheritance pattern with an odds, a very similar odds ratio um, to the Ready et al. study. We did not find an association between APOL1 genotype and factors just including gestational age at time of birth, severity of preeclampsia, and changes in pathology, which is consistent with the Ready et al. study. Our study did not observe a significant association of APOL1 genotype with any scored pathology and, or any pathological features at delivery. This lack of association could indicate that the APOL1 dependent mechanism is directly linked to changes that cause, that is, excuse me, that is not directly linked to changes that cause placental malperfusion or any changes in the placenta. Additionally, APOL1 may not, may induce a novel process in trophoblasts. This would occur earlier in pregnancy and would therefore become a critical factor for failed trophoblast invasion. Therefore, we would see abnormal changes in the placenta increased inflammation, and therefore a, a preeclamptic phenotype would arise. Overall, more studies are needed to assess whether APOL1 genetic testing can predict preeclampsia and can improve pregnancy outcomes in this population. It is possible that there's a phenotypic difference in preeclampsia that occurs prior to 37 weeks gestation or because of a carriage of a G1 allele versus a G2 allele. We were unfortunately unable to stratify by um, G1, G2 alleles, and our data are um, data set lacked individuals less than 37 weeks. But with an increased sample size and future studies, we may be able to perform these tests. 
I'd like to acknowledge my lab, uh, specifically Jackie Bartlett for all of her help um, maturing me when I first joined this lab, as well as our many collaborators, Dr. Leslie Bruggerman, who did the prior work on chronic kidney disease and really led the project, Dr. Raymond Brenline, the pathologist um, and expert on the biobank, as well as Dr. John O'Toole and Dr. John Sidor. Finally, I'm funded here at CASE through a PQHS T32. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Anna. So I'll bring up the chat box to see if there's anything. Um, and while we wait for people to type their questions into the chat box, um, I wanted to ask, um, you know, the, the April 1 story is fascinating yet so confusing. Um, and so, at least for your story, for preeclampsia, um, I mean, is it possible that really uh, some of the associations that you and the previous, uh, the Ready It All or Ready It All paper uh, observed, is it merely a tag for another variant? Is, is there extensive leakage disequilibrium? Um, did, did you have those kinds of data for this uh, particular data set or was it uh, targeted genotyping and you're limited to just the, the G1 and G2? Right. Unfortunately, this was targeted genotyping, but that's definitely possible. And what we're just seeing is just something that's tagged along with another gene that we may be actually more interested in, for sure. Yeah, that's always, that, that may always be the case. Um, and so could, could you also give me some, give us some more information about the phenotyping? Um, so we've heard a variety of different um, resources uh, this afternoon, whether it's, uh, you know, clinical data drawn from electronic health records. So this is a uh, a database maintained and um, collected, I guess, by the um, March of Dimes. Um, so when, you, when you've extracted or have available those clinical phenotypes, are they based on similar things like ICD codes? How good is gravidity measured when you know, most women don't know that they're pregnant and, and so on? So how, how good do you think was the phenotyping for each of your variables? Right, I think um, especially gravidity factors like those are, are difficult to know um, if, if, if it's correct, really accurate. But for most of our factors, specifically pathological variables, they were all performed by the same individual. So we know that any variability that would happen due to pathological variables um, is the same across the board. And um, this all comes from the same hospital system, which therefore makes uh, some of that variability that I'm sure would come out from hospital records um, a little bit better than, um, than previous studies. So again, if anybody has any questions, please type them in the chat box. Um, I did want to ask um, if you could give us some insight on your discussions early on about um, including preterm and term, and and how does that relate to the animal model data? Um, so I'm I'm assuming that the original animal model data was more akin to term in humans, and so what was the discussion about? this March of Dimes data set, you know, and you've got these preterm um, cases of controls. Um, how, how did, what was the thinking behind including them? Absolutely. So we, when we first performed these studies, we looked at all cases and we um, were finding that we were not matching what was seen and ready at all. And so from there, we decided to, to stratify not only by preterm cases and case and term cases, but also by the severity of preeclampsia. We were um, thinking that maybe the data set that we had was um, a different population than the one that was seen in Ready at all. So that really led to our decision to, to separate the data set. And um, since we had a larger sample size and seen in other studies, we had the ability to do that without losing power. Great. So, okay, we see, oh, Mary Davis has a question. Do you have access to any conditions that may occur comorbid with preeclampsia, such as um, cholestasis or ICP? And could you use, uh, could you see how it affects? We did um, remove any individuals that had comorbidities that we thought would um, cause a variability in the, the phenotype itself. Um, but I did not have access to that specific factor, no. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. Okay, so I know we're running a little bit early, but uh, we'll go ahead with our final speaker. Um, this will be Jessica 
Cook Bailey. She is an assistant professor here in the Population and Quantitative Health Sciences Department. She's also an investigator at the Cleveland Institute for Computational Biology. So I'll let you take it away, Jessica. Thanks, Dana. Let's try screen sharing again. All right, thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I titled, I titled um, these slides, Progress Not Perfection, because as you will see, we are not really far in glaucoma with genetic risk scores or polygenic risk scores when it comes to diversity. So first of all, I'm gonna to talk to you today for a few minutes about vision. So if you're comfortable, I'd like for you all to close your eyes. I'd like for you to think about what it would be like not to be able to see. Think about the daily activities that you participate in that would change if you lost your vision. Now think about the daily activities of people who are, are not in academia, right? Who don't have the privilege of being on the CICB symposium today, how they might be affected by the loss of vision. Of course, these are probably different because context matters. You can open your eyes if you, if you chose to close them. Um, and although this is of course an exaggeration of uh, how visual impairment and blindness manifest in most people, it's meant to be a reminder of how important vision is. Um, going blind according to a sort of recent survey, pre-COVID, um, going blind was the number three health fear among those surveyed in the United States after cancer and heart disease. And I think we can all kind of understand that. So one of the leading causes of blindness in the world is glaucoma. Um, it accounts for nine to 12% of worldwide blindness, and it's the second leading cause of blindness in the US accounting for $2.5 billion of our annual health care budget. And that's actually an old number, so it's probably higher. So the word glaucoma actually describes a heterogeneous group of diseases with common symptoms. The disease begins as a loss of peripheral vision, as you can see in the figure on the right. And this, is, this results from damage to the optic nerve. So unfortunately, the early stages of this type of damage often go undetected unless an individual is already receiving somewhat regular eye exams, um, which many of us know are generally expensive, even with insurance and also time consuming. So why would you prioritize this um, if you don't need glasses and have regular follow-up or if you don't already have a vision problem? It's glaucoma is called the silent beep of sight because by the time someone realizes that their vision is damaged from glaucoma, approximately 50% of the axons in their optic nerve are damaged, and this is irreversible. Um, so once they see damage, there's no way to reverse it. So what are the numbers? In the US in 2010, 2.7 million people had glaucoma, half knew and half did not. It's estimated that by 2030, 4.2 million people in the US will have it. And the prevalence is going to just continue to increase. So as our aging population grows, we extend life with medical and scientific advancement, which is great, but the more likely people are to get glaucoma because risk increases with age. Risk is also higher in minority groups, um, as shown in this cute little infographic from the NEI. And what do we tell people to do about it? We tell them to get a comprehensive eye exam. Um, including dilation, which isn't really pleasant, right? Um, because early detection and treatment can help save your sight. Okay, cool. Um, picking up a little bit on what that last slide said, people who, who are minorities are more likely to have glaucoma. They're at higher risk. It's a little bit, it's a little bit deeper than that actually. People of African descent have worse glaucoma all around. Their risk is four times greater 
results in 6.6 .6 times more blindness. Onset is 10 years earlier and the disease is more aggressive. And this is in comparison to their white counterparts. You can see in the graphic on the right, again, older numbers, but these are the most up-to-date available from the National Eye Institute. The prevalence rates are higher in Blacks or African-Americans. Now, this is also complicated by some optic parameters that we'll get into in a few minutes. Um, but really what you need to know here is that it's more prevalent and worse. Also interesting is that the glaucoma prevalence is highest um, in the Caribbean at 7% and in Africa at 4.2%. So why do we why do we care really about knowing about glaucoma? Well, it's really prevalent. It makes you go blind. Why do we care about knowing about it early? If the damage is, is done, why does it really matter? Well, what we know that early intervention in people who are fast progressors for glaucoma can really mean the difference in the level of visual disability. Um, so if somebody's a fast progressor, that early intervention means preserving more of their vision versus late intervention over here. If you can see my arrow, I'm actually not sure. And there are some people who are slow progressors. It would be great if we knew the difference between those people, but I can go ahead and tell you we don't. <laughs> so the most common type of glaucoma is called primary open angle glaucoma. Onset of this disease is generally over 40 years of age. Um, risk increases dramatically with age. So by the seventh decade of life, approximately 15% of individuals will have POAG. The diagnosis requires a comprehensive eye exam, as I already said, in which intraocular pressure, the pressure within the eye, is evaluated. So if you've been to um, the eye doctor and you've had that puff of air test, that's checking your intraocular pressure. Um, the clinician will also look at your iridocorneal canal, your optic nerve to evaluate for the characteristic damage that's done in glaucoma, and they'll evaluate your visual function because there are specific types of visual function loss that are, loss that are characteristic of glaucoma. So various treatments are available. Many of you probably know people with glaucoma, your parents, grandparents, other relatives. Um, treatments range from corticosteroid eye drops to surgery on the trabecular meshwork in the eye, which would open up blockages that might cause that increased intraocular pressure. However, even with aggressive treatment, vision continues to decline aggressively in those that are aggressively treated. So again, those that are diagnosed with glaucoma, prevention of that irreversible vision loss is really the goal of therapy. And we know that POAG risk is complex. Various factors influence it. Age, genetics, sex, ancestry, ocular measures, as I mentioned on another slide, intraocular pressure, which will come up later, and myopia. So of course today I'll focus on genetics and ancestry because that's the point of the session. Um, suffice it to say that the heritability of POAG is complicated. Estimates range from 0.2 to 0.8. The risk indicators, including central corneal thickness and intraocular pressure, as well as optic nerve parameters, are also highly heritable. And I'll show you on the next slide how related they are genetically with POAG. Genetic risk loci have been identified for POAG, over 60 at this point, um, as well as over 100 for relevant traits, but they don't account for the full genetic component. And pertinent to this session, most genetic studies have been performed in Europeans, European Americans, and Asians. So this figure on the left shows you how intricate the overlap between genes associated with various visual traits and endophenotypes related to glaucoma are. So here we have intraocular pressure, very vertical cup to disc ratio, disc area, and POAG. And of course, it's not important for you to know what all of those things mean, but for you to understand the complexity of the genetics and the overlap between these. Now, this figure on the right highlights this as well. There are, there are different types of glaucoma, types of genetic involvement in glaucoma, from monogenic to oligogenic, all the way down to polygenic. 
and same for the risk factors. So it's quite complicated. So I'm gonna switch gears now and show you what's been done in terms of polygenic risk scores for glaucoma. I've skipped a lot of the history on the genetics of glaucoma, but people have been studying this for quite a long time. We do have over 50 variants at this point that are associated, but I really wanted to get to what are, what's being done in the large data sets, especially the ones that other people have talked about. So we heard of the UK Biobank, um, Fred and others talked about it yesterday. It's a large ongoing prospective cohort study that recruited over 500,000 adult participants between 40 and 70 years of age that live in the United Kingdom. Uh, lifestyle, family, and medical info, as well as DNA were collected. For a subset of those individuals, about 118,000, there was also ophthalmological data that was collected. So our group, you can see over here on the left screenshot, and two other groups, worked to try and understand what we could in the UK Biobank data. What all three groups ended up doing is finding a polygenic risk score for intraocular pressure. Remember I said that that was very related to glaucoma. What I didn't say is that approximately 30% of individuals that end up with glaucomatous damage to their optic nerve don't actually have intra increased intraocular pressure. So that's just a little tidbit to tuck away for later. So our group was the first to publish in the UK Biobank. We did a genome-wide analysis. We found 68 new loci associated with IOP and it improved risk prediction for glaucoma. Great. You can see our AUC curves down here. Cool. We looked at them in subsets of glaucoma, so people with normal tension, so those that don't have intraocular pressure increases, and then people with high tension glaucoma, which do have those intraocular pressure increases. This group in the middle did something very similar, and this group on the right also did something very similar. What's really important about all three of these studies that's relevant to the session today is that they all were only performed in people of European descent. Okay, so around that same time, our group was also working on a genetic risk score. Now people go back and forth a little bit about the definition of genetic risk score versus polygenic risk score, but my late colleague Rob, I go, and I were pretty adamant with this paper that we called a genetic risk score. It's only 12 single nucleotide polymorphisms. Why would we call it a polygenic risk score, even though they're in different genes? So in this paper, we did a case control analysis, our genetic risk score associated with increased POAG risk. Good, validation, great. Okay, what was really interesting with only 12 SNPs, whereas those other studies done in the UK Biobank used tens of SNPs, at least 50 in each one. In ours with only 12 SNPs, each higher GRS unit associated with a 0.36 year earlier diagnosis of glaucoma. So if you compare the top and bottom 5%, the mean age of diagnosis was 5.2 years earlier um, for those in the top, which is pretty interesting. So we're starting to get towards GRS, PRS with actual utility. Right, so not just prediction of glaucoma, yes or no, but this person might have an earlier age of onset, which is pretty interesting. Of course, there are limitations as with all studies, um, specifically the age of diagnosis might not accurately reflect the age of disease onset, but anyway, um, we were pretty, you know, pretty excited about this particular study, given that it was only 12 steps and we actually found an effect. However, again, everyone in the study was white. Okay, moving forward. Where are we now? This is a February 2020 Nature Genetics paper um, that our group also worked with. So it was a multi-trait analysis of glaucoma. So multi-trait because of the relationship between all those endophenotypes of glaucoma, we found new risk loci and it enabled polygenic prediction of disease susceptibility and progression. So 
we're moving along, right? We're not just saying POAG yes or no, we're, you know, having some clinical potentially relevance. So in this, we have some very pretty figures here. You can look through them if you'd like. Um, the top 10% of the PRS distribution, they were diagnosed seven years younger versus the bottom 10%, which is pretty interesting. Individuals that had a higher PRS actually had more family members that were affected by glaucoma. The top 10% had twice as many members affected. So this PRS enabled effective risk stratification in unselected glaucoma cases. So the top 10% reached absolute risk for glaucoma 10 years earlier than the bottom 10% and were at 15 times high increased risk of advanced glaucoma. It predicts glaucoma progression in prospectively monitored early manifest glaucoma cases, and it predicted surgical intervention in advanced disease. So again, working towards something with potentially clinical, potential clinical utility. Um, and the sample size in this one uh, for cases was around 7,900. But the sample for this group again, was only European and also South Asian. So we're, we're getting a little bit better. Um, still no people of African descent though. And then this is a very recent paper published in July that I wrote a commentary on. So I've included that here as well. An intraocular pressure polygenic risk score. So another IOP risk score stratifies multiple primary open angle glaucoma parameters, including treatment intensity. So this particular PRS was 146 SNPs. It associated with the maximum recorded intraocular pressure, um, which is important because part of glaucoma treatment is reducing that intraocular pressure. It associated with glaucoma disease severity, whether or not someone needed, according to their clinician, incisional surgery and again, the number of family members with glaucoma. So the progress with this is, again, we're not only looking at POAG status, we're not only predicting POAG status, but how the variation might influence clinically relevant and measurable disease characteristics. And the risk score was developed and tested in independent data sets, which is actually kind of hard in POAG because typically, as you can see from the prior slides, our groups tend to work together and meta-analyze as much as possible um, to detect any effects that are there. Yet the limitations of this, the IOP measures, they vary across clinics. And this is with all of the IOP. Um, this is relevant to all of the IOP risk scores that I've talked about. So those measures vary across clinics. Actually, IOP varies temporally. So if you go to the eye doctor in the morning versus in the evening, even in the same day, your intraocular pressure is gonna vary. It'll also vary based on whether you've had coffee, whether you've smoked a cigarette, whether you've done yoga, whether you've exercised, whether you've played a musical instrument. IOP is also not necessary or sufficient for POAG diagnosis. And it doesn't always reflect an individual's IOP profile or range, which are, which associate with glaucoma progression. So that just means that just because your IOP might be lower in the morning, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be lower during the day, right? So if your doctor says, oh, it's low, you're fine. It may not actually be fine. Also, everyone in the study was white. So why do I keep saying that? You've seen various versions of this, possibly even this one already. This figure from Sarugo, Williams, and Tishkoff cell 2019 shows us the ancestral category and distribution of studies in the GWAS catalog. And you can see in blue the European. On the left, this is studies. On the right, this is actual individuals, which is really important to know because you go from 52% to 78%. And on the right panel here, it's just highlighting why this might actually matter. So differences in linkage disequilibrium, allele frequency, genetic architecture, all influence the transferability or the potential lack of transferability of genetic information gleaned from one population to another. So probably signals may be going undetected in certain groups because they're not actually being evaluated. 
So I can't say that there haven't been any POEG studies done in African Americans, but in reviewing many of them, they were either clinical only, clinical plus genetic only, and very small sample size. They looked at eye health and poverty. They looked at glaucoma and race, not genetic ancestry, but self-reported or worse, third-party reported race. Most glaucoma genetic studies have been done in whites. And then most recently, glaucoma genetics has been evaluated in other ethnic groups. So some of these lack replication or lack clinical rigor. So before we can even think about a PRS in a diverse group, we need to assess the state of the field, right? So this is what's been done, but I will just briefly cover the two most recent studies that have been performed in people of African descent. So we were fortunate to collaborate with the GLAD consortium, the Genetics of Glaucoma in People of African Descent. You can see the study numbers here. This study actually evaluated people that were African American and people from Africa with and without glaucoma. So the discovery set was about 2300 cases and then the validation set was about 6900 cases. Really cool. GWAS, they found a variant that looked that's associated, it replicated. Great. But there's no PRS. Okay. And then there is the primary open angle African American glaucoma genetic study, um, which actually hasn't published their genetic data yet. I pulled this off of BioArchive. Um, they claim that they're the largest ever deeply phenotyped African American population for POAG. And this has about 5950 as their sample size. They use the mega array, which is great because that takes into account genetic diversity across different ancestries. And they found a variant um, that was associated. But again, no PRS. So what are we doing about it? So our group um, works with the Department of Veterans Affairs Million Veteran Program, the MVP. The MVP is a national voluntary research program that's funded entirely by the Department of Veterans Affairs Office of Research and Development. And their goal is to partner with veterans that receive their care at VA healthcare systems to understand how genes affect health. Their goal is a million vets and their samples and information will be de-identified. Biospecimens are genotype sequenced and stored. They fill out health surveys, they give clinical data, and there's access to the, their electronic health records. Of course, everything is de-identified and there are various working groups across the country that are evaluating common diseases and then military related illnesses. You can see over here the various groups, um, various sites that are um, recruiting for the Million Veteran Program. These are just to show you some of the flyers that the MVP has that they give to veterans in that actually get their care at the VA. So it's just some of the information that they might see. Joining is easy. Hop, hop online, go to a recruitment center, give your sample. So we work in the MVP I group. Um, I've only included some of the photos of people that, that work in this group, um, but you can see everyone's name at the bottom. We focus on age-related eye diseases, including, lucky for me, POAG. And very excitingly, there is diversity in the sample um, and lots and lots of genetic data. So in order to actually use that genetic data, we first have to determine how to figure out who are POAG cases and controls. We can't just look in the electronic health record and say, somebody has a POAG diagnosis, they must have POAG. I wish it was that easy, but unfortunately it's not. So right here, I'm just overviewing our case definition and our control definition. It's not necessarily important for you to know all of these things. It's just important for you to know that there are various parts to it and that all are very important. This has been a process of over about 18 months and about 15 iterations of an algorithm to identify cases and controls in the VA EHR. And these are all of our exclusion codes. Again, not important for you to know, but important for you to see how much we thought about this. So far, we've evaluated um, in 200 cases and 200 controls. Thankfully, we have eye care providers at three VA health systems that 
look at what our algorithm picks out as a case and a control and then look at the charts and see, is this a case or is this a control? Our PPV sounds like it's not great. It's 83 and a half percent, but it's actually better than the ones that have been published so far, which is we're pretty excited about. And then our NPV is 97 and a half percent. So it, it identifies POEG pretty well. Um, it's consistently it's consistently repeatable across VA health systems. And um, we, there's lots of strengths to using it. And most importantly for us, it currently identifies over 2,700 African-American cases and over 6,000 controls in the MVP. So we hope to very soon perform genetic analyses with this data, including polygenic risk scores, potentially the first in African-American POAG. Um, So our goal, okay, that all went out of order. Our goal overall would be a POAG risk score, right? What we want though is not just a PRS um, for POAG. We would like one for subtype risk, so that high tension and normal tension glaucoma subtypes, and then the fast progressors that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, risk of blindness, not everybody that gets POAG goes blind and then the likelihood of response to specific treatments, as there are some that are more and less invasive. And then the point of all of these risk scores, right, is development of screening tests to identify patients that are at risk for early disease. Um, this would allow for timely initiation of preventative treatment and then surveillance. So with that, we have to figure out how to explain these to patients and providers, which is something that I'm also very interested in pursuing. But I don't think we really have time to overview these. Just know that in addition to discovery, we also have to have evaluation of how people perceive this risk and then dissemination. So how do we make this into a model that is accessible for people at various SES levels, socioeconomic status levels, education levels, and then not just clinicians, but also the patients, right? And patients across different types of clinical settings. And down here are the list of the studies that we're working on in our group to get at these goals. So yay team science. We uh, are so fortunate here to work with so many great people. Over here is my team. Team Cook Bailey is what we call ourselves. And up here are some mentors. Um, and then these are the grants that are relevant to this presentation. Thanks very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to take questions. And I'm sorry I went over a little bit. Thank you, Jessica. No problems on time. Um, so again, if you want to ask a question, please uh, do so in the chat box. Um, but I, I would like to get the discussion started. Um, so the Million Veteran Program, I'm with you. I'm so excited about this um, resource. Um, so unlike the UK Biobank, it does offer a breadth of diversity, particularly for residents in the United States, um, for um, for many groups that don't have genome-wide association studies, let alone polygenic risk scores available, right, for various diseases um, and outcomes. Um, so I'm curious, so you focus on African-Americans for um, primary open angle glaucoma, um, but, uh, you know, I think MVP would also have some Hispanics and, of course, European-Americans. So what were the sample sizes available when you did your final algorithm run? And do you think now that um, now that we've heard, say, from day one, we heard Dr. Carla Marquez Luna talk about her methods about transferability and really leveraging diversity for, um, in those opportunities, do you think we have a, a prime opportunity to maybe examine that here for POAG, um, specifically with all the different groups available in MVP? So our numbers for whites, we had around 3,800 cases, which is pretty good, but doesn't necessarily compare to the larger studies that have been done. Now, the advantage of that is that they are all within the same electronic health record system, but obviously they're not all in one specific clinic, right? So that variability that I talked about is still going to be there. Um, so I think we definitely have an opportunity um, in the in the whites to do an evaluation. Unfortunately, our Hispanic numbers do not look great for glaucoma. Um, 
Yeah, there are, we have fewer than 300 cases. Oh. Um, which makes, I know, I know. And, you know, we, we definitely should look at this more in depth because it is certainly an opportunity to evaluate, I mean, the GARA study um, that's in the Kaiser Northern California system, I think they had fewer than 200 cases when it came to Hispanic as well. So we're still gonna be competitive. Um, it's just that the numbers are not super great. And in terms of risk um, for glaucoma, I know I showed it on the slide, but I didn't really say anything about it. Um, Hispanics or Latino fall between African American and whites in terms of risk. So there certainly is an opportunity there to look at it. We just may not have as much power as we would like. Well, speaking of power, so Jonathan Hayden asks, um, is there any chance for a meta-analysis of the different African-American studies for primary opening go glaucoma? Sure, why not? Um, several of them agreed to work with us when we wrote this grant. So we'll see what happens. Um, I find it interesting that the two published and the one unpublished African-American POEG study don't seem to have replication. So I'm not really sure what's going on there, why um, the groups don't seem to just like come together and have the best study, right? The best meta analysis, but yeah, we'll navigate that when we get there. <laughs> and we have something to meta analyze, John. <laughs> Um, are your plans also to include, um, say, genetic admixture studies? Of course, definitely. Oh, here's a follow-up from Jonathan. Um, you really didn't mention Asian populations, but there is quite a bit of literature there as well. How well do they compare? How well do they compare with regard to the PRSs? With there was only... Go ahead. With, with regard to um, loci and PRS, if they've done PRSs. Yeah, so the one study, the, the one that said multi-ethnic, it did replicate, our PRS did replicate in South Asian, but um, as you know, the phenotype of glaucoma is a bit different um, in Asian populations. So typically, more typically, there's exfoliation glaucoma and um, angle closure glaucoma. So they don't always overlap exactly the same way. We've also seen in studies that we've done that um, the low side don't always um, reflect because of LD issues. They don't always reflect, you know, the one variant that's going to be associated. So um, I would say the, the one study that has a PRS in Asians, you know, it looks okay for, for glaucoma, for POAG, but I would, I would proceed with caution if it were me. Great. So any final questions from the audience in the chat box? I'm not seeing any. So I want to thank um, Dr. Jessica Cook-Bailey for giving a great talk on primary opening of glaucoma. And I actually want to thank everybody who spoke today, Dr. Ruan Ling, um, Kira Atkins, Anna Miller, and of course, Jessica. Um, we very much appreciate um, you spending the time to spend with us and presenting your work. Um, and I want to thank everybody who registered for the North Coast Conference on Precision Medicine, as well as day one speakers, Fred Schumacher, Carla Marcus Luna, and uh, Athena Starlin. Uh, Davenport. Um, please uh, check our website for updates. We are going to post the recordings as well as any other materials that we might have from the speakers. Um, and also be on the lookout for announcements for next year's symposium. Hopefully it'll be in person in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so until then, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you for organizing, Dana. This was great. Thanks, Christy.